Good afternoon, everyone. Does everyone speak English here? Yes? That's good. Meine Deutsch is sehr verknautscht. Something like that. My name is Peter Letterman. I'm president and chief engineer of the Soundsmith Corporation in New York. Um, I have a bit of a short time, they told me, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. And I wanted to thank you for coming uh, to this seminar on why analog is digital and how to fix it. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've had a love of audio since I think pretty much when I could walk. My two best friends were a, a white German shepherd who was more human being than, than dog. And I had a wind-up, a wonderful wind-up, and I had lots of 78s, and that was, other than the dog, my best friend. And I remember being very little and cranking this wind-up up and just loving it. And I stared at it one day, and I understood it, which was an amazing experience. I understood it was an acoustic fulcrum. It was a teeter-totter, like I'd been on in the playground. Um, it basically, I understood, was translating a large force over a small area to a small force over a large area. It was matching the mechanical impedance of the groove to the mechanical impedance of the air, and it worked in both directions. So we could both record and play back. And I thought, how marvelous is this? And the fascinating thing is the materials were here, and certainly the basic mechanical and physical understanding was around for maybe thousands of years or beyond. Somebody could have created a machine to record sound a long, long time ago, and yet it's just over a hundred years ago. It's pretty remarkable. So um, I have some questions. Are there any people here that consider themselves to be experts in cartridge design or understanding of cartridges? Okay, well, we'll ask a few questions anyway, because hopefully you're, you're here because you have a lot of interest in phono cartridges. Um, what does anyone think groove noise is caused by? What causes groove noise? Anybody? Don't all answer at once. One, the surface, so the, it, the noise is actually recorded in the record groove? That, that's what you're suggesting? Okay, the result of the surface structure of the material, the vinyl. Okay, it's a good answer. Anybody else? Dust, dirt. Okay, but I mean a constant noise, not clicks or pops. Like groove noise, when there's song, when the music's not playing and you hear this noise. Okay, so there are a lot of people that feel that dragging a rock, a diamond, through a plastic groove should make noise. And that's a very logical thought. It's a good thought. And your comment is actually along that thought. The material has some surface structure to it, and therefore the stylus is playing it and makes noise. These are very, that's a logical thought. Unfortunately, it's not the right answer. What actually causes groove noise is something people don't know about. Every cartridge has a natural resonant frequency. So you have a cantilever and a stylus, and you have a, something back here that you have to move in a magnetic field or create a magnetic field that's moving in order to create a voltage. It's a generator. And because it's a mass that's sprung, it has its own natural resonant frequency, like a bell. Everything has a natural resonant frequency. Your cat, your dog, your wife, your husband. Your, your car, and it doesn't take much to get this into resonance. As soon as you start to move it a little, it tends to take off at its natural resonant frequency, like striking a bell. So as soon as you put the stylus down in the groove and it starts, the groove starts moving in a little bit, it starts resonating at its natural resonant frequency. With a moving coil cartridge, that's typically between 30 and 50 kilohertz above human hearing and the volume of it, or the amplitude, is very high. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that shouldn't be a problem. That's way above human hearing. Well, the problem is this resonance is not one frequency. It's a spectrum of frequencies, and they add together, and they subtract. This is called sum and difference frequencies. So if you take a 40 kilohertz resonance and a 30, you get a 10 kilohertz, and you get a 70. The 70 you can't hear, the 10 you can. This is what causes groove noise. 
And it also does something else that's bad, which I'll talk about in a minute. The other source of problems with cartridge is jitter. What causes jitter? Well, when you put energy up the cantilever, as the stylus is playing the record, you put motion into this mass and you have inertia problems. You tell it to move, it doesn't move. You tell it to stop and go the other way. It says, wait a minute, you just told me to go this way. And so it yanks the stylus. Energy goes back down and goes, and the stylus tries to put it into the record. What in life would be similar? Well, imagine if you had a broomstick glued into a brick wall. You don't have to be Enrico Fermi to figure out what's going to happen. If you pluck the broomstick, it's going to do this. Why? Some of the energy is going to go up into the wall, but quite a bit's going to reflect back down. So now you have two sources of energy going back down the cantilever into the stylus. You have the natural resonant frequency, and you have this reflected energy from the mass that the cantilever is attached to that you cannot damp out perfectly. What's the result of this? This is called stylus jitter. Nobody talks about this. Why? Well, if I were a sane cartridge manufacturer, I wouldn't be talking about this mostly because I'm talking about a severe problem with analog. You don't want to talk about the fact that analog is really digital because when you put that much energy back down the cantilever, the only way you're telling the stylus to move the record can't do it. So the only way it can get rid of that energy is to leave the groove wall and bang its way down the groove. You say, wait a minute, if it's only sampling the groove wall, it's banging and dumping energy into the groove wall, how can I hear music? How can I hear anything in the record? Well, which of you had that thing on your bike when you were a kid that rubbed on the front tire and it hooked up or was a headlight, and the faster you went, the headlight got brighter? That's a generator. That's a magnetic generator. And it's velocity sensitive. The faster it goes, the more voltage it makes headlight gets brighter. That's what a cartridge is. It's a magnetic generator. It's a velocity sensitive device. It doesn't matter if the stylus is only sampling the groove wall. As long as it's moving, it's going to make a voltage. It's going to make a signal. It's going to make a waveform. That's what we've all been listening to. So cartridges are producing waveforms that are not representative of what's in the groove on the record. Well, how not representative? It depends on the design of the cartridge. So that's the title of this talk is why analog is digital and how to fix it. People don't tend to think in these terms, but these are the physics and the problems of a phono cartridge. So how do you fix it? And by the way, let me suggest what happens with this jitter and this sampling. It causes groove noise. It causes stylus and record wear. It, um, causes you to sample the groove wall and miss a lot of the information. Same with digital. Uh, it also causes a loss of detail. With that detail goes a lot of the imaging information, depth, positioning. Um, it also creates a lot of distortions, kind of a hardness. People say, well, I, I hit the top end, I hear hard. Well, sure. You're trying to sample a 20 kilohertz waveform in a record, that stylus has taken really pretty bad samples of it. So it can sound really brittle and hard. What's supposed to sound like an S sound will sound sibilant, more like escaping gas uh, or broken glass than a true S sound. Um, so I've described jitter, I've described where it comes from. So the question is, how do you fix it? Well, the way you fix it is you reduce this mass as much as possible. You have less stored energy. And when you drive this mass down, the natural resonant frequency goes way up. And more importantly, the amplitude of it goes way down. So you have less reflected energy, less stored energy, less jitter, more samples per second. It is literally that simple. It's not more complicated than that. The only thing is, is that there are folks that are willing to talk about it, and those most that are not. I think I'm the only one who's willing to talk about it. I love talking about problems. Since I was a, a kid, I was fascinated by all things in science, and I was really interested in 
where the problems were and how to fix them. And here's just the truth of being an engineer. An engineer never gets to perfect anything. Life just isn't that generous. You've got a pile of bills on your desk or you've got a boss breathing down your neck. He says, bring it to market. So you make it work. And when it works pretty well, you're kind of happy because you get to keep your job or you get to keep your business and you get to provide for your family. There are a lot of things in audio that work that are not perfected. For me, that's a gold mine. That just blows my dress up. I'm really happy when I find something that I can make a lot better. Not for marketing. We're not a big company. But because I can hear the result and so can my customers. So here's an example. This is a moving coil. These are a bunch of frequencies in, resonant, in the resonant frequency. And here's my fixed coil. Look, you can see the difference in amplitude. It's absolutely huge. Our moving system is five to eight times lower in mass. Not 50 to 80 percent, but five to eight times lower in mass. And I can show you an image of that, if I can find it. This gives you an idea. This is the smallest moving, one of the smallest moving coil assemblies made. This is my largest moving iron assembly. By the way, this is an iron core here, so it's, it's absolutely visible. And in one of my top cartridges, it's much, much smaller than that. I service a lot of cartridges. People know that I fix tons of moving coil cartridges. I've done that for almost 50 years. And <clears throat> as a result, I don't like them. I don't make moving coil cartridges. I make what I consider to be a much better technology. Who developed the technology that I'm using? Bang & Olufsen. It was a phenomenal engineering feat. And in 1960, they presented a paper comparing an evolution of their fixed coil moving iron system to moving coil. I'm sorry, fixed coil moving iron, I'm sorry, correct, to moving moving coil. And they showed a dramatic mass improvement, reduction in mass, with their moving iron system. Over approximately 30 years, 25 years, Bang & Olufsen made three generations of their moving iron designs, kept improving it, kept reducing the mass, improving the magnetic field. We acquired the license 20 years ago, and we've made three major generations of design improvements. Here's the beauty. There's huge amounts of room for further improvement beyond what we've done. We're going to do it. Moving coil is restricted. You can only reduce the mass just so much, then you're done. It's kind of like a car from 1940s that stopped being produced because they ran out of gasoline. And somebody found a whole bunch of gas, and everybody said, wow, let's start making cars again. And this is what's happened to vinyl and analog. Records have come back. Car companies that you know, were making cartridges said, oh, Wonderful, we can make cartridges again. They hauled out their tooling and their know-how. There were people still alive, and they started making moving coils again. But the design is limited, and it's old, and it can't be advanced very much. This other one can. It has a basic advantage, ultra-low moving mass, with the advantages I talked about before. And some people will say, wait a minute, if this is a better technology, why doesn't everyone do it? Well, I just explained why. It was held under, uh, was held under patent. So I want to bring up something that one of my brilliant competitors wrote about. This is an engineer from Ortofon, wonderful cartridge company. And it gets a little technical, but there's something really fascinating in here. I'll read it, but it's basically a 20 kilohertz signal, 18 microns, one kilohertz, blah, 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 blah. I won't have to go through all of this. There's something down here. This is, this is the telling thing. It starts here. The displacement, the movement of a groove at, uh, of a 10 kilohertz signal, 50 dB below the peak level, displaces the groove 005 microns. That's 50 times the diameter of a small hydrocarbon molecule. If you think about the scale, it says it's almost impossible to grasp, but guess what? A cartridge can trace it in the signal when it's amplified, can be easily heard. This is how sensitive an analog record playing system is. So people will ask, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've got digital, what's so great about analog? Digital has very discrete levels, 12-bit, 16-bit, and so on. 
They are not continuous. They are samples and they are electrically averaged. Analog is not levels, it is continuous. And this gives you an idea of how tiny the scale, bit level if you want, can be detected. Does analog have problems? You bet, lots of problems. A brilliant audio engineer in the States and I'm friends with Lynn Olson, he told me, he said, you need a t-shirt that says, because he said, you've been doing analog for forever. He said, you need a t-shirt that says, uh, the nice thing about analog is it keeps you honest. And it was a brilliant statement because when you do it wrong, you hear it right away. When you do it right, you hear that too. So Ortofon Engineering goes on to say, so a designer must absolutely control all spurious vibrations. They're right on the money. Be they generated by the commonly considered external sources, feedback, footfalls, or internal mechanical sources, the bearing maybe of the arm, or the crucial groove stylus energy interface itself. There's the statement. So I started the talk talking about jitter and sampling. If it can detect 50 hydrocarbon molecules at that level, actually even below that level, imagine what the jitter is doing to lose information in the groove. That's why what I do with my company, I love to do because we have made dramatic improvements in sampling. Now, we have taken that also to an extreme. We make a cartridge called a strain gauge cartridge. What's the huge, there are a lot of advantages to the strain gauge. It's not a magnetic cartridge, it's not a generator, it doesn't generate a signal. It takes the energy that's normally lost in the suspension holding the cantilever, and it couples it into two semiconductor elements called strain gauges. The mass that's normally at the back of this cantilever doesn't exist. So it's sort of like taking the energy in your shock absorbers of your car, you throw away, it gets turned into heat, and monitoring it and getting a signal of what the road surface looks like. That's what we do with the strain gauge. And the beauty of it is without any mass here, and if you damp this cantilever properly at the back end, all the energy goes up, but none reflects back down. There's almost no stylus jitter at all. How do I know this? Does anyone here know what a lacquer is? A lacquer, you do. A lacquer is a record that's cut on a Neumann lathe. It's an aluminum disc coated with shellac or lacquer. Incredibly soft. When you cut the record, you use a ruby cutting stylus, and it's heated, and it just slices through the lacquer like a hot knife through butter. Can you play a lacquer? Yep. How many times? Three or four times. After three or four plays, all the high frequencies are stripped off, and there is the loudest groove noise you've ever heard. I have some lacquers down in our room, we're in cabin 813 at the show here in Munich, that I've played 200 times without groove damage. We're tracking at 2.3 grams, no lacquer damage. So damage to the lacquer is not caused by the downward force, it's caused by this. It's caused by the groove jitter. So I have empirical proof I don't advertise it, but I've received our strain gauge styli back. Styli normally lasts a thousand hours. I recently got one back from a customer in Hawaii. I built one for seven years ago. He plays it all the time, does, works on his computer. The stylus had 6,000 hours on it. And I got upset with him. I said, you should have sent that in a long time ago. It came back, I said, I'm not gonna change it. Looks like it's got 100, 150 hours on it. It's fine, really interesting. So if it's that gentle to a lacquer, imagine how gentle it is to something as durable as vinyl. So um, I have to make this short, so I have to cut a few things out, but um, I wanted to explain what we do. And for those of you who've never seen a micrograph of a stylus in a groove wall, this is obviously a little distorted because it's an electron micrograph, so it looks a little compressed. This system really shouldn't work. This is like a bumblebee trying to fly. It certainly shouldn't work as well as it remarkably does. Because this is just the tip of the iceberg. You're looking at a stylus, it goes up about five or six times or more, 10 times the mass of that. Then it's hooked up to a cantilever. Then it has to dump energy into a suspension and move a mass. It's a miracle that it works at all. 
much less as well as it does. Style of shapes. I want to talk a little bit about this. This is not something that's well understood, so I want to take just a couple of minutes and talk about it because it has to do with the stylus groove interface. There are various types of styli, which many of you, I'm sure, are aware of. Let me just pull up a different picture. So you have the conical, which is like a cone. You have an elliptical. You have, there are a couple of different types of ellipticals. In the business, we have something called faux ellipticals, bonded ellipticals. They're not really a true elliptical. They're somewhere between a conical and an elliptical. Some of them are poorly made. And we, there's a hyper elliptical, which is really nicely made, a linear, a line contact, and a micro line and various types of esoteric contact line. What is the purpose of these? Well, you have a problem. I won't pull up the drawing. You have a problem in a groove where as you get towards the center of the record, the bumps, especially high frequency, get really close together. If you have a conical stylus, it's got all kinds of grief in there because it can't fit into the valleys of the groove. It hops from mountaintop to mountaintop it distorts because it can't trace the groove wall. But if you make a diamond that has a very thin edge, it can fit down into the valleys. That's a wonderful thing. Low distortion at high frequency. But I want you to take a look at something down here. Look at the contact surface, and please forgive the poor uh, copy of this uh, graph. Look down here at the contact surface, just rough numbers. This is a conical, and it shows that it's approximately 30 microns. Uh, in contact surface area, and uh, another conical. Uh, now you get to an elliptical, and it, uh, this is not exactly correct because it should be slightly larger than 20 or 30, so I don't buy this one. Line contact, look, you're getting larger, and look at the, they call it an SAS, so this was done by SAS, but look at a, a very esoteric line contact. It has double the surface area of a conical. So as you get up into more esoteric styli, you're contacting more of the groove wall. You have greater surface area of the stylus. Well, what does that mean? Let's say you're tracking at two grams with a conical stylus. That means you're going to have one gram per groove wall over this much surface area. Take the same cartridge tracking at two grams and put a line contact on it with double the surface area. Now, the force per unit area goes down by half because you've got twice the surface area. It's like a wide tire compared to a bicycle tire. What does this mean? Well, with a conical, you have more force over a small area, larger force over a particular surface area. So it's pressing down into the groove wall harder. Therefore, it's damping at the tip. So any amount of jittering it's doing is reduced, theoretically, because it's got more force against a smaller area. So as you go to a line contact, the styli that play better, it should jitter more, and it does. So what does that mean from a cartridge designer standpoint? What it means is you have to build the structure and the suspension and the materials so that at half the force per unit area, you get the same sample rate, the same amount of jitter as you would, let's say, with a conical. But the conical is terrible at playing the record. So these are one, some of the challenges in cartridge design as you change tip shapes and you get into the more esoteric tip shapes, your cartridge has to handle the vibrations better and have less reflections going back down in order to stay in control. So um, again, I'm going to skip some things because they've asked me to shorten the talk. Uh, let's see what we have. Here is, by the way, what I was talking about. This is part, there are a lot of problems with conicals. And this gives you an idea of what happens to a conical stylus in part. As it traces this groove, notice how the contact points shift position on the, on the stylus. This is yet another problem for conical styli. Not just a high frequency problem, period, and especially at the inner grooves, but a phase problem, a rotation problem problem of phase. One channel is lagging, the other is leading in time as it's playing the record. It's shifting all over the place. A line contact, which is similar to the stylus that's used to cut the record, doesn't have that issue. 
Okay, so this gives you an idea, as when I was talking about earlier, what we do and why we do what we do and how happy we are of doing it. This is the comparative moving mass of a moving coil design compared to our moving iron fixed coil design. You have less reflected energy, much lower amplitude resonant frequency, less stylus jitter. Okay, let's see what else I have. This is another graph. This gives you the amplitude comparison of typical moving coil cartridges and the resonant frequency down here between 25 and 43 kilohertz with very large amplitude. Our highest mass moving iron design, the Atello, this is the comparative amplitude. And this is the frequency shift upwards because of the lower mass. Our Hyperion, which is our top cartridge, our top uh, magnetic cartridge, it's way up at 90 kilohertz and extremely low amplitude. It's even a little hard to measure. What else have we done? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, I love to look for dark corners of engineering. Corners where people just say, well, it works, so let's just leave it alone. Um, we did something about eight or nine years ago with a cartridge called the uh, Hyperion. And it has a wonderful story connected with it. Some of you may know the name Frank Schroeder. Frank Schroeder is a very dear friend. And he's diplomatic and he has morals uh, in a world that seems to be rapidly losing theirs. And he called me one day and he said, uh, Peter, what do you have on your research list for cantilever materials? Because he knows I'm always thinking of, let me fix something, let me make it a lot better. Well, I got down to the third thing on my list and I said, well, how about we're thinking of also using cactus spine? And he said, stop, where are you with this project? And I said, it's on the back burner like 150 other inventions and projects. He said in his best German accent, which he made a little stronger for me, he said, you must move this up to the front burner. And I said, why? And he said, I've just put some cactus spines in the mail to you. And when those things came, I put them under my microscope and I cut them apart. And I, if I weren't so circumferentially challenged, I would have kicked myself in the butt for having not done it earlier. They were beautiful inside. They were stacked columnar cells wrapped with fibers and the cactus needle or spine as it's properly called had a ton of these things packed together tapered down so the mass was lower at the tip and i tested it for strength i said oh my god this thing is gorgeous so it turns out god loves vinyl obviously um i don't have a graph for this but let me explain to you one a really good test for a cartridge it's called an impulse test, and Ortofon is a record that does this. It's a single cycle, about one millisecond long. It's a pulse. And when you look at it with an oscilloscope, you, look, you play it, and you look at the waveform. With a typical moving coil cartridge, it plays the pulse, and then you see two or three pretty big rings, because that mass is reflecting that energy back down. The cantilever's going, hello. So you get, and it creates a waveform that's not on the record. A bunch of three, four, two, three, maybe four, Pretty good rigs and a bunch of little guys. Our former top of the line cartridge was our Cicero. And when you played that pulse, it went up and down and had two medium sized rings and then it was flat. I built the first Hyperion, it went up and down and just went, and I went, holy mackerel. Then I did some tests on the cactus spine. And what I discovered was the spine, I don't know if I can zoom in here. This guy, maybe. What I discovered was that the cactus spine, let's see how much resolution we have. Hey, not too bad. Um, what I discovered was the cactus spine has, is a low pass filter. Nothing above 35 kilohertz gets through it. Just like the shock absorber in your car turns one form of energy into another, in the case of your car, mechanical energy into heat by compressing uh, gas. The uh, cactus spine converts mechanical energy into heat the same way. So anything above 35 kilohertz doesn't make it through. It's turned into tiny amounts of heat inside the cactus spine. What does that mean? It means up at 90 kilohertz, that natural resonant frequency doesn't make it down to the stylus. 
It's another methodology for re reducing jitter. And this cantilever works. So this is, again, another dark area of audio. Cantilevers haven't been changed in 50 years. They're aluminum alloys, they're ruby, sapphire, same material, even diamond, boron, other ceramics. But that's it. And each of them has their pluses and minuses. As you can imagine, the hard ones do a really good job of getting the ener all the energy up, but they do a really good job of transmitting it back down. The aluminum, depending on the alloy, softens some of the information and some of the jitter going up and softens some of it going down. So typically, a cartridge with an aluminum cantilever is going to sound a little warmer, but it's going to leave some prisoners behind. And those of you who are really into analog, that's not a great thing. So, and you'll notice, by the way, we have... Uh, cancel. You'll notice this is an ad which we haven't run yet, but you'll notice I somewhat jokingly say 10-year, 500,000-mile uh, warranty. Um, we offer this cartridge with a 10-year, we're still doing it, a 10-year warranty to the original purchaser against wear out of the stylus. Not damage if you drive your car into a brick wall, we're not going to fix it for free. But if you wear the stylus out to the original owner, we're going to put a new one on, no charge. We also do something else with our cartridge design, which I think is morally correct. We rebuild all of our cartridges for 20% repeatedly for customers. Our high-end ones go down to 11%. This one, if you have an accident with it and snap it, it's pretty hard, actually. The cactus is amazing, amazingly tough. It's designed to stick animals in the butt repeatedly without breaking. Um, uh, this one is 11% to rebuild, and we'll do that repeatedly. So our cartridges actually have a long-term value, unlike other cartridges. If you buy them, they're a good investment. So uh, let's see what else I've got. Um, materials. I want to talk about that a little bit because we've done something new. This is our new design. It's called the ES design. Uh, this is a brand new body design we've used. It was four years in development. We've used it across our entire product line now. Why did we do this? Um, I want to pull up another photo. Yeah, here we go. This is one of Frank Schroeder's tone arms. There it is. And this is, by the way, our strain gauge cartridge. You can see it's lit up. And you can see it in our cabin if you want to come down and hear it. Against the Schroeder tone arm. Frank is an absolute genius. When you have, does anyone remember that? thing that uh, professionals or office people had, or even at home, on their desk years ago, it had five metal balls and they were hanging from a string, it was called the Newton's Cradle, and you picked up one ball and you let go and it smacked into it, and the end ball flew up, but the middle ones held still. Does anyone know why they held still? I won't keep, yes, why? It's open end, but why don't the middle ones move? Transmit the energy? Correct. What would happen if the first one were steel, the next one were brass, the next one were nickel, and the, would they hold still? They wouldn't. You're correct. Because when you look at a pencil in a glass of water, I could do it here, except I like this pencil, you would notice the pencil looks broken. This is because the light, the energy, is going through one medium and then into another, and it shifts vectors, it shifts position. The same thing happens when you transmit energy in from one material into another. It doesn't go directly in, it vectors off. This is really, really important. So Schroeder has designed his tone arms so the energy that the cartridge gives off winds up getting into the back of the arm and gets damped out. This is so critical. I read you the statement from Ortofon where they said, any spurious vibrations. That includes reflections, not just in the cartridge that I'm talking about, but if you think about it, a tone arm is a cantilever. So you've got a larger system in this miniature system called the cartridge and a larger system called the tone arm, all the same problems, all the same reflections, all the same energy problems. Frank is aware of it, that's why he does it. So what we've done recently with our uh, new, and I'll end pretty soon, I'm gonna get flagged out here in five minutes, um, what we've done with our new ES line is designed um, new bodies that, sorry, this won't cooperate, not sure why, um, but our new ES body design is designed to get the energy from inside the cartridge,
properly out into the body so the tone arm can get rid of it. You don't want it reflecting back. How do we know it works? We've taken separation measurements of our cartridges over the many years we've been producing them. The new ES bodies on average are three to five dB better channel separation. It's another thing I want to mention. When you reduce the jitter, now mind you, let's say you have a signal on one groove wall. So this groove wall is going to be doing this. This groove wall is not doing anything. So the stylus is riding in the groove and it's doing this. And it's just smoothly riding up this way. If you have rotational energy coming back down, because the energy just doesn't do this, it actually rotates coming down. The stylus on the smooth wall is going to jitter. Well, that's creating motion up in the other channel. You measure it. It's called channel separation. Channel separation is a really good measurement of how well a cartridge is designed. The more the channel separation, the better you're controlling jitter, the more detail. We have cartridge, normal good cartridges, 25 to 30 dB. Really good, 30 to 35. Our cartridges typically measure between 35 and 45. I have a Hyperion that measures 54. So there, that's, in audio, it's interesting. There aren't many measurements that tell you how something sounds. Audio equipment is, has a larger foot in the musical instrument camp sometimes than the scientific instrument camp. But channel separation is a real measure of how well that stylus is controlled in the groove wall. So. Uh, we've run out of time. Uh, are there any, we've got a, two minutes left, two minutes. Are there any questions that anyone ha might have about uh, the things that I've mentioned? Yes. That's a really good question. I'll try and make a short answer. It kind of depends on the condition of the records. The less groove wall you trace, the less statistical probability of hitting dirt, damage, noise, depends on how the records have been kept. Um, a hyper-elliptical may have better channel separation for the reasons I mentioned before. So we do everything. We have bonded ellipticals, we have hyper-ellipticals, we have contact line, and we have very esoteric contact line. We call it an optimized contour. As you go up, there are always you know, pluses and minuses to everything. Nothing's perfect. So. A uh, more esoteric style of shape is going to place greater demands on the tone arm, the user, for doing alignments. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, we like this one. It's really who's using it and how careful are they going to be. Any, uh, yes? Strain gate. No, the, it doesn't work for the stylus. It's too soft. But let me make a comment there. On one talk, somebody asked me, have you made a cactus spine for the strain gauge? I said, yeah, I made one for Schroeder, and I made one for another person, and I made one for myself, and guess what happened? It didn't improve it. That's kind of fascinating. That means the strain gauge has so little reflections, the cactus cantilever doesn't help it. It doesn't need to. It was very interesting. There was no improvement. That was kind of fascinating result. In the old days, they did use cactus for playing 78s. There were cactus needles for playing 78s. And they work really well. They were warm sound and got rid of a lot of the 78 groove noise. Very musical. Anybody else? No. Okay, glad to have put you all to sleep. Anyway, thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it very, very much. Please feel free to come down to our room. It's, uh, you, know, you can't put your feet up, but you can listen to some music. And uh, thank you for letting me give this talk.